welcome to the Bogosity Podcast for May 30th, 2011. The podcast that only eats Girl Scout cookies if they're made with imitation Girl Scouts. This is your host, Shane Killian. Let's have a beef with the news of the bogus. Last week, this podcast reported not one, but two cases of the Indiana Supreme Court saying that illegal searches are okay. Now the U.S. Supreme Court has followed suit. In an 8-to-1 majority, the court found that police officers may enter a home without warrant or probable cause if there are sounds of scurrying, which may be people destroying evidence. They may also do it if they even so much as smell what they think is marijuana. What? Are they high? Do we need to search their homes for marijuana? Or their chambers? How could they possibly think that this activity is in any way agreeable with the Fourth Amendment? The case was from a situation in Kentucky when police, chasing a drug dealer, somehow followed him into the wrong apartment. When they got to the apartment door, they smelled marijuana. After they knocked and announced themselves as police, they heard noises, so they kicked the door in, with no warrant or probable cause. They found marijuana and cocaine, but not the suspect they were pursuing. The Kentucky Supreme Court suppressed the evidence, saying, and rightly so, that it was the police's fault they were trying to destroy evidence, since they went knocking on the door without a warrant. If they had done their jobs, things would have worked out very differently. But the Supreme Court overturned this. They blatantly rewrote the Fourth Amendment, saying, quote, Warrantless searches are allowed when the circumstances make it reasonable within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment to dispense with the warrant requirement. But the Fourth Amendment doesn't allow them to dispense with the warrant requirement. This is ridiculous. This means that the police can interpret whatever sounds they wish as sounds of someone destroying evidence, even if they're just getting dressed or putting the dog away. And then they get to bust their way in without a warrant. It gets completely nonsensical. Listen to this. The ability of officers to respond to an exigency cannot turn on such subtleties as the officer's tone of voice in announcing their presence and the forcefulness of their knocks. A forceful knock may be necessary to alert the occupants that someone is at the door, and unless officers identify themselves loudly enough, occupants may not know who is at their doorstep. In other words, the police get to bang on your door as loud as they can and yell as loud as they can, but the people inside don't get to react in the same way they would if anyone else came along doing this. The Fourth Amendment is there to allow us to protect ourselves from bad cops, but this ruling completely removes the right of people to evaluate for themselves if the people at the door are good cops or bad cops by saying that the good cops sometimes sound like bad cops. Give me a break! And it doesn't help that what the cops were enforcing isn't even a real crime. Real crimes have victims, but marijuana use doesn't harm third parties. This isn't the actions of police officers protecting us from violent criminals. This is nothing more than the moralistic douchebagging of a busybody nanny state. This also destroys the police-related exigency limitation, in which courts have recognized that police cannot use, as an excuse to make a warrantless search, circumstances that would not exist if they weren't even there. The Kentucky court ruled this way. The Supreme Court decided to ignore all that. The police may now provoke any response they want and use it as an excuse to enter our homes as long as they don't overtly threaten to force their way in. I pledge allegiance to the high priests of the police state of America and to the oligopoly for which it stands, one nation, under arms, subjugated, with liberty to the cops and justice to no one. It's sad that there was only one lone dissenter, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. In her dissent, she said, quote, May police, who could pause to gain the approval of a neutral magistrate, dispense with the need to get a warrant by themselves creating exigent circumstances? I would answer no, as did the Kentucky Supreme Court. The urgency must exist, I would rule, when the police come on the scene, not subsequent to their arrival, prompted by their own conduct. Right on, Ginsburg. If the police can enter homes without warrant solely on what they claim to have heard or even smelled, how do we have any Fourth Amendment protections left at all? Despite the fact that diseases like pertussis, also known as whooping cough, soar everywhere that anti-vaxxers have their way and get the vaccination rate to drop, they nonetheless continue unabated. Despite the fact that numerous preventable diseases, many of which result in the death of children, especially infants too young to be vaccinated, 
rise everywhere they are able to lower the vaccination rate, they continue to push their agenda, not caring the first thing about the incredible harm they cause and the unthinkable tragedies that result from their actions every time parents lose a child to one of these diseases. It's gotten so bad that in New South Wales, doctors are actually warning parents of newborn infants to keep their children at home for risk of these infants contracting pertussis. With over 4,500 cases of whooping cough so far this year, Australian doctors looking at the statistics found that these cases are happening in places with low vaccination rates, and they're not poor places. They're suburbs where parents could easily afford the vaccinations. It's so bad in places that, in one school near Linsmore, pertussis has infected one in five children. Dr. Chris Engel advised, With vaccination rates so low in this area, we say to the mothers of newborns, do not take them out into the community. We're appalled at how many kids are getting whooping cough because the Chardonnay set and the alternatives don't vaccinate their children. The statistics show that these areas with lower vaccination rates had 300% more cases of pertussis between 2008 and 2010. If you're an anti-vaxxer, what's it going to take to convince you? What will it take to break through your dogma and let the incredible harm your bogosity causes make you reevaluate your position? If facts and figures won't do it, then I guess we're just left with emotion. And we've got plenty of that. The newborn son of Jay and Rosalind Smith was taken to the doctor. According to the symptoms presented at the time, little Kayla Smith just had a cold, but two days later, he stopped breathing and had to be rushed to the hospital. Too late, as it turns out. Kayla didn't have a cold, but pertussis. The family are all vaccinated, but Kayla was just one week away from being old enough to receive the vaccine. When Kayla arrived at Mater Hospital in Sydney, he was placed on life support, but was just too weak for it to save his life. Now, what could have easily been prevented with a very cheap injection resulted in tragedy for the Smiths and their two-year-old daughter, who have had a joyous experience of a new son and little brother, only to have it snatched away from them. This is not an isolated case. Little Kalis is just one of seven infants to die from this horrible and easily preventable illness. Infants that young have only one chance at protection, herd immunity. All an infant has to do is come in contact with one infected person, and their weak bodies can be ravaged by a fatal disease, even one that's so mild when contracted by an adult. Why don't you take a walk in a graveyard from two centuries ago and see all the infants that are buried there? Is that really the legacy you want to leave for the future? Think about poor Kalis. Think about poor Dana McCaffrey, only four weeks old, suffering, dying from this horrible disease. Think of the words of her father. We have tried to make some sort of difference ourselves when we were standing over our daughter's grave and thought people needed to know about this. But still, only 18% of adults are vaccinated. Imagine such a small baby in a hospital in misery dying. Dying needlessly. How can you possibly live with yourself after participating in the heinous lies that sent these poor children into the storm? When you max out your credit cards, what do you do? You cut back on expenses and try to pay them down. Of course you do. What should your employer do when his business can't borrow any more money? The same thing. How would you feel if, instead of cutting back, he spent more and raided your pension fund to pay for it? Well, that's exactly what the federal government has started doing. On May 16th, the Treasury Department officially reached the debt ceiling, meaning that it's unable to borrow any more money unless Congress raises it. So what did they do? They started pulling money from federal pension funds. The Obama administration said the Treasury could tap into the pension funds of federal employees to fund programs that would ordinarily be funded with more debt. Unlike Social Security, which consists of nothing but IOUs, these pensions are stored in market-based funds like 401ks. If a private corporation did this, they'd be prosecuted and the perpetrators behind the policy put in federal prison. 
A republic of the people is made by the rule of law, and no one is immune. But an oligopoly of the rule of men means that there are those privileged few to whom the law does not apply, and it is all too clear which of these our country is rapidly becoming. In case you were thinking it's just the American government that's been missing a few brain cells lately, a committee of the Council of Europe, a cooperative union with 47 member states, is considering a ban on mobile phone and Wi-Fi networks in schools. And of course, it's based on all the bad science and fear-mongering about cell phones causing brain cancer and a host of other bogus claims. According to their working paper on the subject, quote, One must respect the precautionary principle and revise the current threshold values. Waiting for high levels of scientific and clinical proof can lead to very high health and economic costs, as was the case in the past with asbestos, leaded petrol, and tobacco. The thing is, there was already lots of scientific evidence about the dangers of asbestos, lead, and tobacco smoke. But not only is there no evidence showing the supposed dangers of small power radio devices, well-established physics, dating back to Einstein over a hundred years ago, shows that these frequencies cannot physically cause harm to living tissue. They're just not powerful enough. It's the ultraviolet frequencies and above that are harmful. But between these radio frequencies and the ultraviolet, you have an incredibly large range, which includes the entire visible light spectrum. You'll see your cell phone glow before you see it cause any harm to you. Their findings are unsupported in any scientific journal, yet that doesn't stop them from calling for a ban on such devices in schools and other places where children assemble. Not only that, they also call for, quote, information and awareness-raising campaigns on the risks of potentially harmful long-term biological effects on the environment and on human health. In other words, a forum to spread this misinformation to an even wider audience. Hey, Council of Europe, how about raising awareness of how real science is done and how to tell real scientific findings from bogus fear-mongering? Unfortunately, that seems to be the last thing the governments of any kind want to do. In related news, another laughably bogus story going around says that cell phones can harm the sperm in adult males when phones are worn around the belt or in pants pockets. A survey of 2,000 men showed that men who talk on their cell phones every day had a lower quality of sperm, whatever that means, than men who didn't use cell phones. But this just may qualify for worst study ever. Not only do they admit that they didn't control for any other factors, the 2,000 men surveyed were patients at infertility clinics. To make matters worse, CBS News gave credence to this bogosity in their Tech Talk column, even going so far as to speculate on yet other problems to scare us with. Quote, We hope these scientists get to the bottom of this, for the sake of our unborn children. Perhaps they should also run tests to see if our cellies are nuking our ovaries and whatnot. I really hope that's sarcasm, but reading the entire article, it sure sounds like he's serious. And if that weren't bad enough, even respected media medicine man Sanjay Gupta, Notice I said respected, not deserving of respect, says that he uses a wired earpiece on his cell phone for fear that it might cause brain cancer. I wonder if he'll be moving his cell phone away from his junk now in response to this. Okay, in fairness, he doesn't say for sure it's a danger, just that it's too early to tell. Quote, The latency period or time between exposure and recognition of a tumor is around 20 years, sometimes longer, and cell phone in the U.S. has been popular for only around 15 years. But Sanjay, it's not like cell phones are our only experience with radio frequencies. It used to be radio DJs would spend their entire careers spinning their stacks of wax directly under the radio station's transmitter, getting far more powerful radio signals to their body than cell phones use. Where are all the instances of these DJs getting cancer? Why aren't the peddlers of this bogosity looking at them for confirmation of the dangers of radio frequencies? Probably because they won't find what they're looking for, and that'll mess up their whole agenda. Listen to this. Anyway, who likes the idea of a microwave, even a low-powered one, next to their head all day? Here's the bogus implied association with microwave ovens. Technically, microwaves are the same frequency range as cell phones and Wi-Fi, but a microwave oven can put out over a thousand watts of power. Not only that, but the microwaves have to be enclosed to create the standing waves that actually cook the food. This is like saying, being in a 350 degree oven will cook you, therefore it's dangerous being out in 70 degree weather for a long period of time. Gupta also said, Many will roll their eyes at this, 
scoffing at the precautionary principle on display here. Fair enough. Still, I like my wired earpiece, and I don't have to turn my life upside down to use it. Hey, Sanjay, you know what else is cheap and easy to use? Aluminum foil hats. So when will we be seeing you sport one to protect yourself from the increased danger from cell phone towers, Wi-Fi, and maybe even digital television broadcasts? Because if radio frequencies are dangerous, then the danger is all around us, in much greater quantities than your cell phone uses. A few years ago, the National Health Service, the government-run healthcare system in the UK, was officially limited in its permissible waiting times for medical procedures to 18 weeks. If you talk to the nutty proponents of universal healthcare, they take an even unbelievable 18-week wait as a sign of government healthcare working and insist that no one is waiting any longer. Well, statistics have just shown them to be wrong, and these statistics don't come from some wonky libertarian think tank, they come from the NHS itself. Currently, over 10% of NHS patients wait longer than 18 weeks for medical procedures, the highest it's been since mid-2008. A spokes stooge for the Department of Health said, Waiting times go up and they go down, but this data shows that waiting times remain broadly stable. But what this bureaucratic goon doesn't tell you is that even an 18-week wait can mean the difference between life and death. The universal healthcare nuts will tell you that the only people put on the waiting list are people who aren't really sick, whose surgery is elective. But these elective procedures include things like hip replacements and even cancer treatments. The Federation of Surgical Specialty Associations, which represents about 15,000 surgeons in the UK, say that there's no evidence that the procedures people are put on the waiting lists for are of limited value. In a statement last month, they said, quote, the lists include types of hip, spinal, ear, nose, and throat, dental, obesity, and cancer surgery for which there is overwhelming evidence of benefit. The only justification for these lists can be that they are a means of reducing expenditure at a time when the NHS faces a financial crisis. Peter Kay, chairman of the British Orthopedic Association, said, quote, This growing rationing is unfair because it is leaving more and more patients in pain, discomfort, and misery. But it's also a false economy because it stops some people from getting back to work and costs the state unnecessarily in welfare benefits for others. Plus, conditions like arthritic knees, hernias, and varicose veins don't get better by waiting. They get worse and can cost more to treat when the patient is eventually treated. It's even worse than that. Since cancer treatments are also delayed, those delays can make the difference between the cancer being treatable and untreatable. Everyone knows that the healthcare system in the U.S. is far from perfect, but clearly government healthcare is no solution. People need to realize there's a difference between free market healthcare and the corporatist healthcare system we have today. Before government meddling in the 1960s, we had the cheapest, most accessible healthcare system in the world. Almost everyone was covered, and those who weren't could get treatment from the numerous free clinics and charity hospitals that were everywhere. Those were driven out of business by rising costs caused by licensing restrictions, health insurance corporatism, the HMO Act, and many other such government reforms. The whole situation makes it clear. If you have a problem created by government meddling, you can't solve it with more government meddling. You get the government out of it and let the one system that has already proven itself come back into play. Now it's time to move your investments overseas to protect them from this week's biggest bogani emitter. USA Today has published a column calling the concerns over the growing U.S. national debt hype, using arguments that would get them laughed out of an Econ 101 class. After laughably claiming that big debts are good business practice, they begin with the incredibly bogus statement, quote, The United States generates approximately $14.5 trillion in GDP each year and carries, currently, $14.3 trillion in debt. That represents a debt-to-income ratio of roughly 1 to 1. No, it doesn't! GDP is not income. GDP is the total amount of production of all goods and services in the economy. GDP measures the productivity of all businesses and consumers in the United States, not government assets. There just isn't any sense in which GDP is appropriate here. Government income is revenues, not GDP. Revenues from 2010 were $2.217 trillion. That is the income. Compare that to the $14.3 trillion debt, and you end up with a debt-to-income ratio of nearly 6.5 to 1, not the 1 to 1 ratio that USA Today laughingly claims. 
They then tried to make their case by signing the debt-to-income ratios of several large corporations, such as IBM, with a debt-to-income ratio of 2 to 1. But the only two they cite that are in excess of the government's real ratio of 6.5 to 1 are Caterpillar, which sells financial products and insurance, so of course it's going to have a high debt ratio at any given time, and J.P. Morgan Chase, which is a bank and which is in the business of loaning money. They make money by borrowing it. They then loan it out at a slightly higher interest rate, which means income in the long run. That's the next bogus thing about this analysis. For these companies, the debt works for them and enables them to increase revenues and profits in future years. With government, it's just debt, which itself brings no prospects of future revenues. There's also a big difference of scale here. If all you have in the world is a dollar, and you borrow ten dollars, it wouldn't take all that much for you to make ten dollars to pay the debt back, even with interest. A couple hours at a minimum wage job would do it. Your debt ratio of 10 to 1 would be no problem. But 14.3 trillion? When, according to USA Today itself, GDP is only 14.5 trillion? Who could possibly think it's a good idea to have a national debt approaching that of the nation's GDP? They also ignore the concept of a rolling debt. IBM may have a debt-to-income ratio of 2 to 1, but that does not mean that their debt doubles every year. It's entirely possible for them to pay off that debt one year, take out another loan next year, and still have this 2 to 1 ratio in a completely sustainable business model. Really, the ratio doesn't tell you all that much about the financial solvency of a business. Think about it this way. If you have a $200,000 home mortgage and your income is $50,000 a year, that's plenty of income to service the debt, assuming reasonable household expenses. Yet, using USA Today's bogus metric, your debt-to-income ratio would be 4 to 1. It's important to understand here the difference between income and net worth. Income is the revenues generated over the course of the year. Net worth is the total value of all the assets held by the corporation. According to Wikipedia, IBM's net worth is over $113 billion, making their debt of just $30 billion paltry by comparison, and certainly not a 1 to 1 ratio. If we look at their debt-to-assets ratio, it's actually 1 in 3.8, not 2 to 1. If this is confusing to you, then you're probably thinking of it as a zero-sum game, when in fact IBM is borrowing the money to invest in the corporation, increasing their ability to bring in future revenues and adding to their total net worth. So next year, IBM will be bigger, and if they can use their increased size to cover more debt to expand even more, more power to them. But government debt just does not work that way. Politicians take out debt and then spend it on their favorite programs however they want. It just isn't done in a way that increases net worth or future revenues. So when the time comes to pay off the debt, the only way the government can get the revenues is by taxing people. And this brings us to the biggest hunk of bogosity being flung by the economic know-nothings at USA Today. Government uses debt money to pay for its programs, and that debt must be paid off with increased taxation on our children who aren't even old enough to vote yet. Taxation without representation. What makes it even more egregious is that Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner has said that the debt ceiling must be raised so the government will, quote, be in a position to pay back its bills in full. In other words, they have to borrow more money to pay off existing debts. This is like taking out another credit card to pay off the previous one. Does anyone think that's a good idea? And does USA Today really think that this is what IBM and J.P. Morgan Chase are doing? The entire article not only violates everything taught in Econ 101, but goes against everything that anyone skilled in money management knows, even if it's just balancing your checkbook. Government debt is not a sustainable rolling debt, it is not a debt that increases revenues, and it's completely bogus to try to cover all that up by substituting government revenues with GDP. And going through the incredible accounting gymnastics they did to make government debt appear to be no big deal, when in fact it is having a major detrimental effect on our economy and the futures of our children and grandchildren, just makes USA Today a shoe in for this week's biggest bogan emitter. Now it's time to bang our gavel on the head of this week's Idiot Extraordinary. UK court judge Justice Keith made a ruling on a case against a 19-year-old woman who stabbed her mother. Her defense was that at the time, she was possessed by the spirit of her dead grandmother. So what did Keith do? He set her free because, quote, She believed spirits can enter the body and make you do things that otherwise you would not have done. Her beliefs could have made her think she was possessed by evil spirits at the time. What? This was after a jury, who had heard all about how she donned dark clothes, gloves, and balaclava, 
crept up on her sleeping mother and stabbed her in the face and five times on the arm. They heard her family members give evidence that the whole family believed in witchcraft and none of them blamed her. And then they did the only thing that rational people could. They found her guilty. And then this joke of a jurist overturned all that. Even if he had good reason to think she was being truthful in her belief, all that means is that she's insane, a danger to herself and others, and needs to be locked away. But then, a psychiatrist declared her to be of sound mind, so that leaves one of two conclusions. Either she's guilty of murder, or she really was possessed by her dead grandmother. Which do you think it is? Yeah, me too. Which is why nobody else other than Judge Justice Keith could possibly be this week's Idiot Extraordinaire! Well, that wraps up this Esculapian edition of the Bogosity Podcast. Please visit the forums at bogosity.tv where you can read the show notes and participate in discussions about these subjects and anything else you like. And if you'd like to participate in the Bogosity Podcast, you can send a question, statement, news article, or rant to podcast at bogosity.tv. If you put it in an MP3 file, it just might get played in the podcast. Thank you for listening. Until next time, here's a quote from Thomas Brackett Reed. One of the greatest delusions in the world is the hope that the evils in this world are to be cured by legislation. Kinder Toten Leader was composed by Gustav Mahler and was performed by Dietrich Fischer Dieskau, accompanied by Rudolf Kempa conducting the Berlin Philharmonic. The Bogosity Podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 3.0 Unported License. Bogosity. <laughs>